Welcome to another Café Release. I'm very excited about today because I was prepping this one and it brought me straight into my childhood. Uh, sometimes it's sensible to discuss my origin as a Belgian, but uh, yeah, today it's exciting because it's all good things from Belgium and France and uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, Christer, could you introduce yourself? Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Christer Sundelin and I am from Sweden. I live in Gothenburg on the west side. Uh, and uh, I've been playing role-playing games since 1982, I think. Um, and writing role-playing games since 1992. Uh, so that's kind of my superhero identity. My real identity is a copywriter. Uh, so I write stuff for other people who can't write, usually engineers. Cool. And if there are any engineers out there, I, I'm sorry for making a joke out of you. <laughs> well, technically, my last employment was at the, in an engineering consultancy. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no problem with that. I mean, it's I think engineers should rely more often on the help of people who are more dedicated to writing. Uh, uh, yes. I'm the first. Uh, I mean, engineers they have their skill set, and language is usually usually not one of them. So. If you are to communicate one engineer skill to another one, another engineer, uh, it helps to have someone in between writing it clear and uh, uh, in a clear way. Yeah, it's it's really key. There's so much work invested in very complex projects and stuff, and then it often fails with communication. But we're not here to discuss about that. <laughs> uh, I've got two ice-breaking questions in those. Uh, quotation mark where at times um, okay. did, did you pick up any what, what's your routine like in those times of lockdown in some countries are you still in are you in lockdown in Sweden what, what is life like are, are things different for you at the moment um, not well uh, as it happens that uh, I actually lost my job some days uh, some uh, weeks ago uh, and I will have a new job so that's uh, just temporary I mean role playing games writing role playing games is um for many of us it's uh, a side thing we don't do that for a living we simply uh, you simply can't make enough money from it um so uh, well otherwise i haven't been bored out of my skull sitting here in my apartment waiting uh, waiting for um, it to be safe to go out well uh, boring that's not what i've heard of kickstarter <laughs> campaigns usually usually yeah. people are rather busy <laughs> Oh yes, I mean that, those uh, those last two weeks have been hysterical, really. It's been it's been a new f a full time job just handling that. And have you picked up any new hobby or skills uh, due to the lockdown, uh, being stuck home and getting bored? Well, um, I started to building terrains for the uh, for terrain for the day when we open up and we can actually play in in person again. Terrain? Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, very simple terrain, you know, with cardboard and uh, glue sticks, hot glue. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, really simple. Yeah. So so t you're you right in the middle of a of a Kickstarter. When when is the uh, was it the deadline for for us to pledge for that Kickstarter? That would be next Thursday at uh, eleven a.m. in Central European time. So that's ten a.m. in uh, Britain. So I guess. People should rush there. So, oh, yeah, yeah I, for once I'm doing something, I'm trying something new. I hope it won't crash uh, my computer. But uh, I thought it was important to show some visuals of your game, but uh, maybe why I show them. Could you tell us about about uh, the troubleshooters? What What is it about? Where, where it comes from? Uh, well, it comes from... Uh, I mean, I grew up with uh, French and Belgian comics. Um, there wasn't really that much fun for for, for me as a ki as a kid in the about uh, late nineteen seventies, early nineteen eighties. I mean, there were some slapstick uh, comics for old people, which were completely boring. Uh, there were some a, f a few American ones like uh, Spider Man, Batman, uh, Superman, basically. And the rest of it came from uh, from France and Belgium. And I don't think that there's, a, there's any role player in Sweden who has not been inspired by them. But I discovered that there aren't any role playing games for them. So a few years ago, I was sitting on my couch. I was reading a new 
uh, anthology of Yokotsuno, and I figured out that, well, if there aren't any role playing games about this, if, if, if inspired by this, then I have to make it myself. That's amazing you quote Yokotsuno because among the pictures I selected today, there are pictures of Yokotsuno. Uh, you know, it's, it's weird because. So I grew up in Belgium and the Franco Belgian bande dessinée, as it's called there. It's, it's so yeah. much everywhere, or at least it was in the 80s and 90s. And it's, it's, at the same time, it's so much everywhere when you're Belgian or French. But at the same time, it's very difficult to assess how much of all of that is known outside of those countries. So, so you said these are quite popular in, uh, in Sweden, or at least they, they were? Oh, yes, they were. Uh, I mean, they were, it was basically the only thing that we could, uh, could get. And they were published by a Danish uh, publisher called Carlson IF. Um, and they brought brought them um, brought these uh, comics home uh, to to the Scandinavian market and uh, just translated them and published them. Uh, the most popular wa uh, were, of course, Tintin. I don't think that was on uh, Carlson. Uh, Spirou was, I think. Spirou uh, um, Yokotsuno was spread out all over different publishers. Um, Semic was another publisher, which, were quite, which was quite big as well. Um, Valerian and Laureline, of course, and um, well, a lot, a lot more. What, so, well, what, what format were they published on? Uh, was it because in well, in Belgium you could buy the art ball, uh, hardcover, rather thin. Uh, A4 format one, big ones, but often you would have them also uh, serialized in, in magazines and journals for, for youngsters. So was that a format you had also in Sweden? No, we just had the album format. Slightly bigger than A4, actually. Uh, uh, it's not exactly A4, but a little broader and a little sh uh, less, less tall. Cool. So I was wondering... Uh, well, first of all, the, the thing with, which is tr absolutely Mm, I used a lot of um, uh, art stolen, actually, just downloaded from the internet, just as uh, placeholder graphics and interim graphics. And it was, I noticed that I focused on uh, Frankan quite a lot, Menuera, um, Tilieu from Gilles Rodin, um, and um, uh, Roger Leloup from Yokotsuno, uh, and these kind of blended together into an art style. And we have a great artist called Ronja. Um, hello, if you're listening. Hello, Ronja. Um, <laughs> and uh, she took all these influences and blended them together and came out with her own style. Uh, what I find very, very cool, which really comes across in, uh, in the art, Mm. Um, the action is quite important, actually. It's it's very. I mean, it's very hard to uh, to make a role playing system that is fun and uh, doesn't have any action in it. You can have interaction, but if you really want to speed things up, so you have to go for action. So it's a basic role playing based system. You roll a percentile dice under your skill level. 
uh, it doesn't have any abilities, uh, sorry, characteristics. Uh, we, we bake those into the skills instead so that we have a unified system. Um, the combat system is simple and, and it's very, very much focused on um, just resolving the action and getting rid of the MOOCs and uh, uh, just passing this scene to get into the next one but while still having fun. Um, you cannot, it's very, uh, I was going to say that you cannot die, but it's, it, that's not exactly true. It's very hard to die. You're, uh, it's very hard to get knocked out, knocked out and becoming un unconscious and being captured by the villains. But it's much harder to actually die. You really have to choose to die, to choose the risk to die. Um, a lot of the system is actually outside that task resolution and is, is instead in a story point economy. You have complications which give you story points. You can spend them on activate abilities which uh, do certain things. Uh, you can also use story points to alter the world a little bit insert new things that were, that weren't there before. Uh, you can, well, so a very, a very great deal of the game is based on that economy. So in that- and, uh, yeah. The reason that, is, uh, that it is so easy to, to uh, I mean, when you're caught, it should be quite easy to get out. And that is because of the story point economy. You get a lot of story points for being captured. Which you can then spend. So how do you integrate vehicles in that because vehicles are something which is featured prominent prominently in in those yeah. cartoons and uh, in your in your heart also yeah well we used uh, a system quite similar to uh, the skill challenges in uh, Dungeons and Dragons 4 which was one of the better things in that one uh, so you set a target number that number of successes uh, successful task checks uh, whoever gets that number of task checks uh, wins a skill challenge so uh, you set up uh, and uh, then you take turns basically to describe what uh, what you do with your car and if you get to the number like three or five or whatever you win you win the car chase cool. uh, one thing I thought was interesting so yeah, yeah go ahead we had an earlier earlier system based on uh, inspired by uh, James Bond. Oh, that's role playing game, which uh, where you didn't roll, uh, make any, where you didn't make any task checks until uh, fin uh, you finally folded. Instead, you'd raise the difficulty and, and describe how you did it, and then the other part had to raise the difficulty and so on. But nobody wanted to use that because there were no ro roles involved. They, they were not what? Sorry. No, no they, didn't, they didn't get to roll the dice. Oh, so yeah. Nobody wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, it's funny. The the system might serve the narrative, but there are, I guess there are some uh, player focused imperative like rolling a few dice or a lot. Uh, sometimes uh, <laughs> it's what people yeah, are so after. So instead of taking turns of rolling dice and trying to get to the number of successes first, that was much more fun. We discovered. That that's funny. That would be uh, that would be cool to have uh, access to those rules uh, for those who are, who are curious. Uh, maybe uh, that's a goal to unlock uh, alternative mm -hmm. rules. Um, one thing. I, uh, so before this interview, I had a little t bit of time and I rushed into trying to pull as many pictures from the internet mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah.
uh, I really wanted to be there. Uh, I think that it would be stupid not to write a role-playing game that excludes half the market. Um, so we wanted uh, we wanted women in the game. We wanted people of color. Um, we uh, simply uh, so we wanted diversity. Uh, in another role-playing game that I've made for the Swedish market, um, one person came up to a friend of mine and, and pointed at an image of a, a colored elf and said, that's me, I'm in this game. And she was so happy about it. Um, and that was a great eye opener, eye opener for me because I had just trusted uh, my illustrators to, to make those illustrations. And um, so we had a great, we had, we had a big talk about it afterwards and we came down to the decision to really aim for diversity in uh, images and in the description in the text Uh, there is an adventure book in the Kickstarter uh, called The U-Boat Mystery. Uh, there is also two quick play scenarios that is going to be written, one by me and one by um, uh, Gabrielle de Bourg. Um, and there will be uh, future adventures as well. Uh, we also have a few things that we can, un can unlock in the future uh, as stretch goals. I think it works fine both as uh, one shots and as campaigns. Uh, the quick uh, the quick play scenarios are meant to be one shots. Uh, one of them, which should be published any day now, um, is for a co uh, for conventions like one or two hours, uh, or maybe in half an hour if you have people just dropping by, uh, and that's fine. But also we want to be able to play these long campaigns, so there are rules also for. Uh, what you do in the downtime between adventures. Is there... Uh, I was wondering... So I'm preparing my, my own... Uh, it's a long-term, somewhat long-term project, Kickstarter. But on one hand, I was a bit concerned working on my Kickstarter that uh, a lot of the interest for it because of the connections I have is people from Europe. And at the same time, when I listen to advice about doing a Kickstarter, publishing a role-playing game, a lot of the advice is to have a a lot of people in the US to have a, because it's the biggest market and also when you have a critical mass there it's easier in terms of, of logistics but if it's split between Europe and the US it, it's it's a challenge uh, I was wondering again me growing up with those bande dessinée uh, yeah how popular are they in the US and do you have a, a lot of how did you approach the US role players did you approach them in a specific way and or did they answer or, or was it just a, a well not just but a campaign m more European more continental in a way well it is continental I, uh, I mean uh, outside Europe Bond and Ao aren't that great you can find some in Canada apparently because of the uh, the French speaking Canadians um, but in the United States there's basically just Tintin and uh, the Smurfs uh, and the rest is just completely unknown to them. Uh, but again, as you say, it, it, is, it is a good thing to, um, to reach out to the American market. But we couldn't, we felt that we, it was diff we, we couldn't call it, call it, uh, call it uh, Bond DNA because they wouldn't understand it. Uh, we couldn't call, we could almost not call it Franco-Belgian comics. Uh, I mean, that would just feel elitist or strange for them. So we ended up with the action adventure role playing game and let the, and let the cover even speak for itself. I think it's a and good I think approach. That's the right approach because yeah. we have got quite some traction. I, I thought it was, I don't know where it comes from. It's quite fascinating that this whole 
part of graphic expression, graphic storytelling. I, I really see, obviously it's more complex than that, but I sort of see, because where well, uh, I grew up, graphic novels as a triptych. You've got the, the American comics, you've got the manga, yeah. and then you've got, uh, yeah, this thing which doesn't even have a, an English word, Franco-Belgium graphic novels, and I thought it was fascinating how the three of them have different ways of being created, uh, owned by their creators or not, and they had very specific format. I mean, the, the comics is soft cover, quickly print, yet colored, the manga is black and white, uh, to be thrown away almost on, on cheap paper. Uh, graphic novels are really expensive. When, <laughs> when I try to buy one uh, for the value to money, I mean, the, the art is gorgeous, but it's very expensive for, for the quantity compared to manga and comics. And, and then yes. you, got, you got in the US, you got the ownership of the comics belongs to the company. In graphic novel, it's sort of an in-between, and in manga, it's, it's the author. It, but it's, I find it so weird that, yeah, there are so many graphic novels which I think would be very popular in the US from classics like 13, which I suspect has inspired Jason Bourne or Soda or, I mean, Spirou and Fantasio. I don't see why US children wouldn't be interested in that. Is it something you're aware of? You, do you know why it was never successful there? I think that it's... Uh, because I mean, I mean, I think that the manga grew big because there were kind of an underground mov movement uh, bringing it over, uh, and I don't think there was one uh, for that for uh, for uh, French and Belgian comics. It kind of stayed European, and there was no interest in marketing them to uh, to the United States. Uh, and the only exception is again Tintin. And the Smurfs, uh, which yeah. which apparently were quite popular and used a lot yeah. in advertisement. Yeah, and they uh, they also became great toys. Yeah. Well, uh, it could be that simple, really. I mean, so, uh, that there weren't enough toys made for them. Yeah, it's it's weird because toys it's it's also a common feature in. If you go in a French or Belgian comic book, or if you go uh, not too far from Sweden, uh, you go to Copenhagen. I went to Farao Cigar, okay. based on the. Oh, that's fantastic. It's a fantastic <laughs> shop, and you got all those toys, those action figures. Well, it's it's a bit more adult thing, so it's more like a little statue than a. And you got your your yeah. Tintin rocket and uh, your Spirou and Fantasio statues, and and again all those those vehicles to play with. Yeah, I so wanted one of the Sorg Globes flying machines. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you, you, it's, they're almost impossible to get. Uh, they were impo impossible to get uh, in the days before eBay. The, in those bande dessinées, you got a rather wide range of things, actually. Uh, things which can be very mature and things which can be very childish. You got things. We mentioned Yoko Tsuno. It, it falls more in the realm of science fiction, not quite hard science fiction, but sort of science fiction. You got yeah. retrofuturism with Blake and Mortimer. Uh, one of my personal favorites, I would love, uh, maybe I should uh, run it with troubleshooters, is, um, uh, I don't know if it was ever translated to English, Lepotism, The Small Man. It's about... Uh, oh, yes, uh, I remember uh, them. Uh, a whole civilization city miniaturized and they live in secret alongside but they got this crazy technology with those really really awesome vehicles uh, you got stuff that, like the sky mustache and then you got stuff like Togo which are really medieval fantasy uh, are there mm. are there levers within troubleshooters to have sort of this range that you can play between things which are uh, more hard realistic and others which are, are more ca cartoony or different levels of technologies and so on? We have focused on uh, a 1960s, imaginary 1960s, and we're kind of generous with that. I mean, we have uh, Lancia Stratos as one of the main characters' cars um, that was released in 1973. Uh, the Concorde is flying. In our 1965, it actually didn't enter service until 1976. Uh, 
French and Japanese team and landed on the moon in 1964. Um, and um, so, so we're, we're kind of generous with 1965. I mean, steam trains are still running and so on because they're cooler. Um, but um, we are not really exploring into, uh, I, I should say, put it like this, that we are open to uh, go into those venues in the future. Uh, but at the moment, we'll, fo we'll focus on this era. Uh, we have some ideas of, of what we could do. I mean, in the game itself, there's mention of um, a United States and the Soviet, uh, to, of, 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 of to those two having a, a space station. Um, well, one each, actually. Uh, so there are science fiction things. We have ideas where we can take that further. Uh, we are considering to uh, involve the supernatural in some way. We really don't know how, but for the moment it's more like Scooby-Doo, I guess. Um, when you pull off the mask of the ghost, it's actually your neighbor, uh, your your your, your um, neighbor or your grumpy uncle or something like that. Well, the 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 influence itself is you, you got those elements. Uh, you take Spirou and Fantasio. It's it's well rooted in the fifties, but yet they got uh, amazing submarines and different mm -hmm. types of machines which are uh, which are happening there. I'm trying to add more pictures because we, we're discussing so many stuff. Uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's a pity not to to show them. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what what is the the main adventure about included uh, in the in the game? Uh, it starts off as a mystery adventure about a uh, journalist who disappeared uh, while investigating a marine expedition somewhere in the in Southeast Asia. And as the characters follow their uh, the, uh, that trail, they end up learning about. Um, a U-boat which sank in that area in 1945, the last days of the war. Uh, and that U-boat had some secrets in it that which the villains are trying to get. And um, hopefully the characters follow up on that and steal those secrets before them. So it's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, are there specific things you you want to, to tell about the game? I'm running out of, of questions. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, I think it's uh, the curious thing about writing about this game is that I'm actually writing for two different audiences. I mean, we have the older audience that which grew up with these comics, of course, and then there are uh, there uh, there has been as I as I um, have seen it a resurg resurgence in interest in these comics among younger readers, uh, at least in Sweden. I have the impression that it has been more or less constant, uh, a constant um, for, for younger audiences ever since, ever since it started uh, in the French speaking market. But in, in Sweden, it, it kind of disappeared in the 1990s and have now have had a resurgence. So, I feel that I'm writing for two different audiences. I mean, the old guys and the new guys. And um, that is quite an interesting experience. Did you get I really any... Hope that, I really hope that new players pick this up and get into the role-playing hobby because they love the comics. That would be awesome, man. I mean, it's... I find role-playing games is one of the few hobbies uh, when you do have clubs where you have interactions between different generations you got older and younger players and uh, yeah sometimes often the the older ones might be the game masters and the, the, you got a, a lot of younger ones uh, learning about the hobby when, when it's uh, in a, a club environment at least uh, and outside the UK but here in the UK sadly it's, it's a bit different it's a bit different uh, you, you cannot really have kids in most clubs because they are in pubs but uh, did you have any feedback yet from I don't know, players running the game uh, for their children or for younger ones and uh, having yeah, an opportunity have, to expose had, them to that? I had a few uh, playtest groups playing with the kids and they, they kind of loved it. Uh, the problem was really that the game is written in English and translated into French. 
uh, but there isn't a Swedish version of it. Um, because we identified the, Swe- the the international market as a big one. It's yeah, it's uh, that. So you're running in parallel a Kickstarter campaign for an English and a French edition, or how does that work exactly? Uh, we simply p- you, you fund one, uh, you fund the game, and then the pledge manager you will select which language you want your book in. Fascinating. I mean, that means campaigning in two countries, producing everything in in two languages. That's that's quite an incredible uh, publishing endeavor. Mm. And we will uh, we, we we have a great partner in France, uh, Arcane uh, Asylum Publishing. They are doing the uh, the translation for the core book and for the adventure book, and we will then uh, produce both books in both languages, uh, and have them delivered to uh, to the pledgers to the backers. And then there are a few items which are multilingual. Um, for instance, we have uh, the character sheet, which is actually a passport. Um, it's a 32-page booklet, which uh, uh, on the first in A6, so it's quite small actually. You, you could put in, the, you could stuff it in your uh, shirt pocket, and it fits quite nice. Um, so that's a 32-page booklet, and uh, it's only like the first six pages, which have that actually, uh, which actually has any game data. So there's one page for skills, one for abilities and complications. Uh, one for personal information and so on, uh, and the rest are uh, the rest of the pages are um, spaces for visa stamps. <laughs> Excellent. So with with each adventure where you go abroad, there will be a sticky sheet with the um, uh, uh, visa stamps which you can put into uh, put into your, your passport. Uh, I wonder and, now uh, if level, yeah, it's just on the higher level there will be an actual stamp as as well that you can. Oh, so cool! That that's so. I mean, again, it's it's right on spot. The craving for any kind of memorabilia. It's something you know. The collector aspect is something really which is tied to to that culture of statuettes and props and so on. So yeah, the the passport is awesome. So modifius. So uh, sorry, uh, the passport is also. It fits very much with the theme of the game. I mean, I, I usually describe this game as. Um, uh, f- fantasy tourism, where you go around the world and uh, have these exciting adventures, um, and you never leave the kitchen. That was definitely a, a, great, a big part of all Sorry. of that. The the travel side, uh, going uh, all around yeah. the world. That's definitely something which made me want to to travel, reading Tintin and, and Spirou, because I mean each. Usually the format often is one's adventure is about one place. Even Asterix, when you think of it, they go around different countries and each album mm-hmm. is set in a different country and you go there and you got your favorite one because oh, I love I love the one about Great Britain <laughs> of Asterix. I love the one about New York uh, in, uh, in, t- in uh, Spirou and, mm-hmm. yeah, and Tintin about China. Mm. So, Tintin in Tibet is one of my, my favorites. It's... It's an absolute um, classic. I mean, and it's it's the idea of journalism, you know, old school journalism, and with with all with its flows of being fantasized and uh, with the bias of the time, it it was still really a, an eye opener and got the imagination yeah. excited to see those places as a child. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, one thing that uh, Karl Barks and Hergé and uh, Roger Leloup had in common was that they were sub- subscribers to uh, National Geographic. And they often read these uh, these uh, issues and f- f- and read about these wonderful places where, where they had f- these f- uh, photo articles about and th- and thought uh, and, and they basically uh, had, seem all to have to think uh, the thought of I want to I want to have an adventure there. So they wrote their own stories about it. I mean, uh, as Karl Barks imaginary places like uh, Tralala and Far Away Storm, they came from the National Geographic. There were often authors like that. I think it's notorious that uh, Van Am for 13, he, 
he never actually traveled that much, but he, he would have all those pictures from magazine. And later on, when he was very successful, he was sent out photographer to New York to to photograph everything in the street, including <laughs> the the light poles, etc. But he he wasn't a traveler himself, so it's all these reconstructed foreign countries, which are not quite real, but yet very detailed. Yes, uh, Lilou had tons of reference photos and tons of toy cars uh, for, to use as a reference and he often made uh, models of his spaceship wow uh, and so and so on so, uh, he was really i don't know if he's still alive i don't uh, i don't know I, know I know a few of them left us uh uh covin a uh, great scenarist more more in the humoristic side but he did do yeah. scrum mustache and an awful lot of graphic novel uh but yeah uh, we got someone in the the chat who's been active thank you so much we got savel from canada uh he's been telling a bit about his own experience in canada with bookstores and the u.s mar market uh but he had a, a couple questions so uh, one of the things he said is that actually he recently watched the man from uncle the movie and told that the after reading the the quick start that it would be a, an amazing system to to run adventure it, it's true the man from uncle it it's kind of uh, uh i i really need to work out an english word for this uh comic strip here it's not it's not comic strip yes. but anyway uh so uh uh their question uh is um, are there things like travel guides, which are considering, uh, you know, source books, travel guides, which would develop the world uh, that you are considering releasing? And, and overall, this question or the, their question was, uh, is, is there a roadmap for, for supplements already? Um, yes, we have a roadmap for supplements. Uh, we have what we call our great 10 year plan. Wow. Uh, it's kind of... <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, but we have a 10-year plan of roughly what we want to uh, release uh, with the first period of most adventures and then uh, adventures plus campaign books and uh, uh, source books. Uh, and in the final three years, then we'll go into the esoteric stuff. So, um, oh, speaking of roadmaps, Ah, oh, nice. <laughs> the uh, guide map of Paris. Oh, yes. And um, so and that's based on an, on a 1963 map, so it's I hope it's quite accurate uh, accurate for uh, for the time period. Yeah. Um, it's it was fun that he mentioned uh, the man from Uncle because uh, if I am going to describe the game for um, the American market I would actually go to The Man from Uncle, possibly The Saint, uh, the new Netflix show of Car Carmen San Diego, uh, and those, which quite fit very well into the into the theme and the uh, and the feeling of the game. Yeah, I don't know the origin of Carmen San Diego. I mean, beyond when I was a kid, I used to play the video game, which, uh, mm -hmm. funnily enough, was sold with alongside the, an atlas. You had a, a pocket S atlas. And the uh, protection against piracy of the game was that when you started the game, it would ask you, go to page 65 of your atlas and finish that sentence. But to be honest, with a, a little bit of geographic knowledge, you, you could circumvent that <laughs> with yeah. guessing the answer. And yeah, no, they got the comic show and it's, it's definitely that. Uh, if, you, if you're looking to sell to the Japanese market, I, I, know if you, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with Lupin the Third. Because it's Lupin, Lupin the Third is also uh, the other thing that I compare it to. Uh, I'm, I was very, very, very fond of the part four, the, the Italian one. Yeah, it's it's really good, and it's yeah, it's. I never thought of that, but yeah, you definitely have this influence. We tend to forget that now because things sort of drift away in different realm of influence and uh, graphic identity, but when so France and Belgium being extremely influenced by Japanimation, much more than than the US. I mean, the US they 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 influenced now by it, but they sort of started ten, maybe ten, fifteen years later than us, because we had a lot of shows which were co-produced between European countries and and Japanese. So 
Uh, I guess something, another good reference would be, I don't know if, yeah, I think the, the British might know about that, Sherlock Hound, uh, which was by yeah. Ayao Miyazaki, who later did the, his first, so Ayao Miyazaki, you know him for Poco Rosso, uh, Spirited Away, mm -hmm. Princess Mononoke, My Neighbor Totoro, but his first movie was actually Lupin the Third. he made a movie, The Castle of Cagliostro, which is on Netflix, yeah. so go check it out. But before that, he did a TV show, a cartoon, animated TV show, which was with anthropomorphic animals, but for Sherlock Holmes. So Sherlock Holmes was a dog, and and you had this craziness of action and vehicles and travel also, and uh, yeah, all of that was in there. Yeah, I remember that one. Uh, for me, it was... Uh the the thing that got me interested in that part was um uh once upon a time space oh wow that's that brings me to my childhood uh, i love this one yeah. uh, the yes, art of and that's another thing that i want to make a role playing game of someday <laughs> the, the the art of that is fascinating because you don't really you start having this kind of visuals in a bit in guardians of the galaxy but it's really the mm visual art of the covers of science fiction novels in the 70s and 80s the Fleuve uh, Noir uh, you collection you see a lot of Chris Foss influence in spaceship design I recommend if you're into that there's a, an artist called Pascal Blanchet and uh, his yeah. art is really reminiscent of, of those covers like the old covers of Dune and things maybe, maybe the Dune movie will bring back a, an interest in that but you know, talking about old things, I was wondering, uh, Tintin, I know it's off the table because, uh, pardon my French, but they are terrible people, the people with the copyrights. Believe someone from Belgium, or at least born in Belgium, uh, the people behind Tintin are terrible individuals, for which we have to thank them for Indiana Jones. But uh, the people of Dupuis, I, I don't know how bad they are, would you... Would you consider approaching them uh, when your product is successful to do something which is actually licensed uh, IPs from, from Dupuis? That would be really, really cool. I mean, Spirou with Fantasio is the main influence, really. Uh, at least art style. Uh, adventure style, yes, a lot of it, uh, but uh, there's a little more tendency towards Yoko Tsuno and, G and Gilles Jourdain. But yes, to do something with Dupuis would be really, really fun to do. Uh, I've been a bit scared about uh, even suggesting the idea to my uh, to my colleagues because, I mean, we are small producers in Sweden. Uh, have, we don't our name outside uh, Sweden is connected to Cult Divinity Lost, the horror role playing game. It's nice to and, branch uh, out with something different. Yeah. <laughs> So the troubleshooters is completely different, um, but uh, so until we have made a name with the trouble troubleshooters, I don't think that we uh, would be taken seriously. Yeah, I wish it's funny because not only I grew up in Belgium, but I grew up in Charleroi. So Charleroi, it's where Marcinel is. So that's where, yes. at, at least until recently, the headquarters of Dupuis were. So. There's, a, there's actually a lot, you know, you would go to those conventions and have, I have a ton of books which are signed and with sketches by by some of these artists and, and you would always know someone, the father or someone, and then they would get you drawings from uh, uh, the, the little Spirou or I got some drawings by Bruno Gazzotti. Uh, <laughs> I got I got quite a collection. It uh, it was a, a small world ba back then. I I don't know, but uh, yeah, things has changed quite a lot. Uh, the Savel was telling about Canada. Uh, I don't know if things are right now, but it's it's been tough at the same time for for this industry in those countries because they've been. They, they did not manage to reach beyond Europe. I think they definitely reached in Italy and Spain, I know to some extent, and in Nordic countries. But at the same time, uh, over the last couple of decades, they had to face the competition of manga and uh, oh, yeah. and comics. And and comics didn't used to be really a thing. Maybe it's more now uh, with, with the movies. Uh, manga, that was a thing when I was a kid. It became very yes. big. And 
Yeah, on one hand, it's a very interesting influence because you see graph those artists from Belgium and France take on the influence, the influence, and even go to Japan and do manga themselves. Uh, yeah. And you can see manga taking in the influence as well. But uh, yeah, in terms of of market, it's uh, it's intense, <laughs> and it's a it's a hard sell because again, it's it's expensive. I wanted to start reading Black Sad, uh, which got mm -hmm. a, a role playing game, by the way, by uh, Nozolo Roll. Uh, I think there's an English edition, uh, which is anthropomorphic animals again, but uh, no, in a war noir setting. But when it's, I wanted to it's buy, so it's gorgeous. So but go but uh, and and re really kind of noir in in its feeling. I mean, it feels like um, ni like 1950s black and white movie. Yeah, that's definitely the feel. And when you play it, it's really fun because the the fact you're playing animals suddenly you play a gorilla bodyguard <laughs> and you know you in yeah. in role playing it it is anthropomorphic so you can still use your body uh but you mm. you definitely take the mimics of the animals of the cats the dogs and so on but when i wanted to to check on it or even check on valerian and uh, laureline uh you buy them oh, yeah. it's it's so expensive <laughs> it's really yeah. really expensive uh, I heard that there was a Valerian role-playing game released uh, like last year, about about a year ago. Yeah, I heard something uh, about that, but yeah, I didn't. Uh, I'm not that connected. They they just release so many stuff in France, and they they don't always bother reaching across. But actually, uh, that reminds me of a question. So you mentioned your um, guest from uh, Sweden. Uh, I believe Cult is distributed by Modifius, and I believe Modifius is going to distribute the um, Troubleshooters, and then you are going to arc an edition. Or, or did you all got in touch with one another? Did Modifius introduce you to, to Arcan, or is it a, an ongoing relationship thanks to Cult? Uh, Arcane uh, they, they, publishes Cult in, in, in French as well. So it was kind of natural to reach out to, to them when we decided to make the troubleshooters uh, and ask, "Do you want to do you want to be in on this project and do it and do it in French?" And uh, they were, of course, interested in that. Uh, and then we decided on to making the core our version of the game, uh, the non-French version, into English instead. Uh, and as we did. Um, we found out. We figured out that we figured that we needed um, someone who knew the international market, and uh, since they uh, Modifus had distributed Cult, um, we found it natural to turn to them to them as well. It's very interesting this dynamic, and uh, I wish so much success to to the three of your businesses. This dynamic of bending together with each of you having their own specialism. And and going for yeah for the big market for the U.S. you are the European players and you you bringing in their mm. own things your your tales from the loop your your cult and now trouble shooters and uh, hopefully that that mean exact and I hope some exciting French role playing game as well and bringing them to the U.S. market it's uh, it's quite cool. Uh, well, we are on, on lockdown now, but did you have any plans of going to, to Gen Con or do, going to Gen Con online? Because this year there's an online version of the event. Okay. Um, we have um, uh, an agent, I would say, in the US who will do, do marketing there. Um, and we're discussing with him how, uh, how we should handle Gen Con. It's possible that we have a booth there that, that we will appear in person, that he will appear there for us. Uh, but that's really for next year, really. Uh, as for the online version, that, this is the first time that I heard about that one. Yeah, actually, I'm wrong. It's it's not Gen Con which has got an online version. It's Origins. So, okay. Um, so, yeah. Which I found out through a, a Canadian game designer called Jason Pitre. Uh, really lovely mm -hmm. chap who recommended I play test my game over there. So I'm running 12 sessions <laughs> of my game there. So people should uh, should try to sign up if they are approved by the organizer. If they don't wonder who is this nobody running 12 games uh, in three days. Uh, yeah, Savelle from Canada thanks you for doing an English version. Uh, being Canadian, uh, their French is not as good, uh, but so the the English. <laughs> It's uh, it's definitely helping. 
Uh, we are coming to a close. I'm going to have to wake up my son from his daily nap because that's what sets the time of this stream if you're new uh, with this stream. <laughs> <laughs> I, have no, I, I start when he goes to bed and I stop when uh, I have to wake him up. Uh, do you have anything else to, to add about your project or anything really, uh, Krista? Uh, I really hope that... Uh, that um, uh, I really hope that people will discover this and in uh, and both get into the Bond SNA uh, in general and also into role-playing games through this game. Uh, I really, really would love to see more and younger players into the game, into the hobby. I mean, it it has become... Uh, we, we, we are old. <laughs> we are getting older. We are not getting younger. Um, <laughs> So uh, getting some new blood in, in into the scene would be great. Yeah, it definitely. And uh, so uh, Savel actually is saying that Gen Con will have an online edition. J the details were not okay. released yet. So, so yeah, we should uh, definitely meet there. Uh, what was I thinking? Yeah, new generation would be nice. Uh, yeah, I was I was wondering. Uh, uh, I don't know how much you are aware of what is available in English and French, but if there was one album you would recommend to viewers that they one bond dessiné they could check they should check out uh because you think it, it's truly a blast which one would that be one or several uh i think the one that made the, the most impression on me was the yokozuna album daughter of the wind uh because it was so fantastic in uh when it involved uh, a secret plot to make new hurricane weapons, um, submarines, jet planes, uh, and even ninjas. I mean, it had everything really, and it's it, and some somehow held together and was a really exciting adventure. And that was my entry into Yokozuna, which I am so happy that I was introduced to. Yeah. I haven't read that many Kyokotsuno. I've read bits of it in the uh, Spiru magazine, uh, but it's so funny that I found the picture and, and that's the, the one you mentioned. Okay, uh, I think that's it. Uh, so if you could say your goodbye and maybe tell people where they can find you if you wish to be found and remind people where they can find the Kickstarter. Well, on Kickstarter, obviously, but when it hands and uh, what are the details and which pledge is the good deal? What, what pledge level is really the one you recommend people get? Uh, we have the pledge level uh, of first class plus, I think, is the most valuable one. Uh, you get quite a good set. Uh, you get uh, the core book, you get the adventure, you get them in a special edition cover. You get the stamp, which you can use to stamp the passport. You get a set of, st of, uh, of passports as well. And you get the travel set, which contains dice, map of Paris, um, stickers and um, uh, equipment cards in a nice portfolio. I, I really need to find a, a new job. I'm unemployed at the moment also, so uh, if I, I can <laughs> do it by the end of the Kickstarter, or I will do a late pledge, which is something uh, people often forget about, uh, because uh, that's that looks really, really cool. Thank you so much, yeah, Christopher, for joining. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I keep cutting uh, you. Yeah, if you don't uh, if you don't care for the special edition, uh, then the business cost class plus is pretty good uh, value for money as well. Great, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, and uh, well, best wishes of success uh, with your Kickstarter campaign and and going beyond uh, uh, after the campaign to to find to be successful in distributing that abroad and spreading the word about. French and Belgian bond dessinée and uh, Spaniards and Italian because they, they got their thing also going on. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. Uh, see you around and uh, yeah, please go check the Troubleshooter uh, Kickstarter. Oh, we got a Portuguese who joins join us in the the chat room. Hello, how? Please go check the Kickstarter. Cheers, bye.